Hi, my name is Manish Gupta, and in this video, I'm going to talk about an overview of small language models. Uh, let's get started. About a year back, I sort of recorded another such uh, talk on overview of large language models. And, uh, you know, at that time, large language models used to mean transformers, BERT, GPT-T5, those kinds of models. Then, you know, there were other variants of BERT like uh, Roberta, Electra, uh, Diberta. And uh, then there were natural language generation models, BART and T5 that I talked about in that particular uh, talk. Uh, then, you know, there were other things like multilingual models, multimodal models. There were other interesting topics like compression and distributed training. Lastly, there were also, uh, you know, an introduction to GPT-3, how GPT-3 works, instruct GPT works and prompting, right? So that was about a year back. Now, uh, in the past few years, several new things have happened. Specifically, if I focus on the past one year, many, many models have come up. And uh, rather than just looking at really large language models with trillions of parameters, people have basically started talking about uh, relatively smaller language models, models in the range of uh, a billion to, let's say, like something like 15 billion parameters, right? So if you really ask someone, hey, what is a small language model, right? How small a model you'll call it a small language model. That's sort of very difficult to sort of say what is small versus what is large. Um, yeah, uh, you, you see the terminology has sort of evolved from artificial neural networks to deep learning to large language models and to small language models now. So I would broadly say that I think the community accepted definition of a small language model is uh, about 1 billion to 15 billion parameters. Okay. So this is a kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, range in which these few models work, and uh, that is what is going to be uh, the focus of this video. Okay. So let's get started. Okay, so essentially here is the agenda. I'll be talking about models based on Llama and Falcon because Llama was the first model which became publicly available, uh, you know, especially the 6.7 billion checkpoint, which uh, sort of started the work in this area. Then I'll talk about models based on Llama 2. Uh, then we'll go over models based on Mistral. And uh, then I'll talk about the five series from Microsoft. And lastly, a little bit discussion on Indian small language models world. Okay. So, so that's the uh, that's the broad landscape that I'm going to cover in this video. Okay, so let's get started with uh, models based on Llama and Falcon. Right. So, uh, you know, uh, early 2023, um, Facebook uh, Meta basically came up with this uh, uh, model called as Llama, and they made those uh, four checkpoints publicly available. So, uh, or rather, they, they made checkpoints publicly available for the Llama model. This was the first time uh, that. Uh, uh, a model with billions of parameters was actually competing in terms of uh, accuracy with the GPT-3 uh, sized models, GPT-3 or even larger sized models, right? So um, Meta's Llama basically consists of language models of four different sizes, as you see them here, 6.7 billion, 13 billion, 32.5 billion, and 65.2 billion parameters, right? Um, so these four different uh, uh, sizes of models differ in terms of number of heads, number of layers, and dimensions. So as you see, uh, the smallest one, which is basically the most popular one, it's also called as the Llama 7 billion, right? Nobody calls it 6.7 billion. People just call it Llama 7 billion parameter model. That one has 32 layers in it, okay? So if you compare it with bird base, bird base has only 12 layers. So remember, Llama 7 billion has 32 layers, and the largest guy basically has 80 layers, which is 65 billion parameter model, okay? They trained it uh, on 1 trillion to 1.4 trillion tokens from public diverse data sets, okay? So that's that. Now uh, their training required huge compute power. So 2048 800 machines, 80 GB VRAM, right, for five months. But the result was really awesome. They basically were able to show that compared to a really large language model like GPT-3, which has 175 billion parameters, Llama 13 billion was better in terms of several number of tasks. Now again, I'm not going to go into details of all of those tasks, but they compared against several, several natural language processing benchmarks, right? Um, so, and they showed that their Llama 65 billion parameter model, the largest of their uh, uh, of their family, is uh, approximately similar in terms of performance with respect to Chinchilla 70 billion and the Palm 540 billion parameter models. So, if you compare with these large language models, I would call these guys as LLMs. You know, uh, Llama was a small language model which was shown to be comparable or better in terms of performance across several natural language processing benchmarks. Now, if you think about the architecture perspective, uh, Llama brought in these three changes, but otherwise Llama is basically just a transformer decoder. Okay. 
32 layer to 60 layer transformer decoder, but with these three changes pre normalization, uh, swiglu activation function, and rotary embeddings, right? Rotary position embeddings. Now, if you think about it again, these three are not new that came in Lama. So they borrowed pre normalization from GPT 3, swiglu activation function from Palm, and uh, uh, rotary position embeddings from GPT Neo. Okay. Uh, and, and yes, it was trained from public diverse set of data sets. So these are the training data sets that were used to pre train the Lama model. Common crawl, uh, C4 data set, GitHub, so code from GitHub, uh, Wikipedia web pages, entity pages from Wikipedia, uh, clean books, archives, stack exchange, and so on. So, uh, you know, small language model world made it sort of very pop, very, very common to actually use this clean curated data in some ways to pre train these models and also uh, combined with the, the large unclean uh, web data, right? So, later models basically focused on cleaning up this unclean web data to learn better models. But uh, uh, this has been the trend in the small language model world. You take like curated, uh, you know, uh, data, which is still very large in size in that sense, but curated clean data relatively. And then you also take like a large snapshot of the web and train it, use it to train these small language models. So now how does Lama perform? As I mentioned in the previous slide, it performed really well. Now here are more details. Specifically, they uh, sort of showed performance on common sense reasoning benchmarks, question answering benchmarks, reading comprehension benchmarks, mathematical reasoning benchmarks, code generation, massive multitask language understanding benchmarks. And they showed that Lama does really well across these various kinds of, uh, uh, you know, uh, capabilities that an NLP system is supposed to possess. OK, so. On common sense reasoning, they actually experimented with several different data sets, not just one or two, several data sets. And they showed that Lama 65 billion was better than Chinchilla 70 billion or Palm 540 billion. And just Lama 13 billion was actually beating GPT-3 175 billion parameter model. So, so notice the uh, size change, right? So 175 billion is uh, about uh, um, you know 13 to 14 times larger than 13 billion Lama. Question answering, they experimented with uh, standard natural questions and trivia QA benchmark data sets, and they showed that Lama 65 billion is the best, um, better compared to any other language model, uh, large language models. Right? Reading comprehension, they uh, experimented with the uh, race benchmark, which is basically English reading, reading comprehension exams for middle and high school Chinese students, and they showed that the Lama 65 billion is approximately same in performance to Palm 540 billion. And if you look at Lama 13 billion, again, that beats GPT-3 model. Okay. Mathematical reasoning. So basically, this is on two different uh, uh, two different benchmark data sets, math and GSM 8K, which basically involve middle or high school level uh, math problems. Even on those data sets, they basically showed that uh, Lama 65 billion is better than Minerva 62 billion. Now, what is special about Minerva? Well, Minerva Minerva is a large language model. It's a Palm model which is fine tuned on huge number of tokens from archive and math pages. So it is a model which is specifically trained for mathematical reasoning. And they showed that Lama 65 billion parameter model is actually better than that specifically trained, mathematically trained model also. Okay. In terms of code generation, they basically uh, showed results against two benchmark data sets, Human Eval and MBPP. And uh, uh, what they showed is that Lama be performs better than Google's Lambda or uh, Palm models. Right? Lastly, on MMLU, well, MMLU is a, a bunch of 57 different uh, uh, subjects, uh, uh, you know, a multiple choice questions data set. Uh, it basically contains questions from humanities, STEM, and the social sciences. And they showed that on 57 different subjects, uh, you know, the instruction tuned Lama, uh, Lama I, Lama instruction tuned model, 65 billion parameter led to better. Mm -hmm. So now the uh, next question to ask was that uh, we already have a model which is comparing, uh, which is performing as good as large language models. Uh, the question was that can clean web data alone alone lead to powerful models? So, so to be able to get clean data, uh, the folks came up with this data set called as Refined Web. So they took uh, the Common Crawl data set that Llama folks also used, five trillion tokens from Common Crawl. And then uh, the idea was they came up with this uh, data set called as Refined Web, which was basically used to train uh, the bunch of models called as Falcon series. So Falcon, basically, uh, the initial models that came up were 1.3 billion and 7.5 billion, two different uh, sized models. Um, so the Refined Web basically contains 768 million individual web pages, and uh, you know the size is about uh, 2.8 TB uncompressed. Okay. So if you compare the refined web with several other data sets, so remember C4 was basically used to train the Lama model. C4 is huge, so essentially, uh, you know, it's basically 100% web-based data set, and there are some, you know, cleanup steps which were done. But as we will see in the lower part, you know, refined web was refined even further. So basically, the cleaning was done much more strictly, right? And then there are other such data sets which are available. So like the data set to train GPT-3 model, the pile data set, Palm data set, and so on. 
If you notice, several of them are publicly available, but amongst the curated data sets, the pile is the only other publicly available data set. And uh, if you really compare uh, refined web, it is basically one of the largest publicly available, available data set, at least at this point when, uh, uh, you know, in June 2023, when the refined web was made publicly available. Yeah. So it has about 5000 giga tokens. So it's basically a very huge uh, data set. Uh, of which 600 giga tokens were made publicly available by these folks. Okay. Now the way these create these, these guys created defined web was to basically, of course, take uh, you know very large common crawl data set, five trillion tokens, and then define it over several it so several iterations or several steps in the pipeline. So the pipeline practically contained three main steps: document preparation, filtering, and deduplication. So uh, in general, document preparation basically included three steps further, URL filtering, text extraction, and language identification. Now, all of these are pretty uh, obvious steps in some ways, right? So you have a very large dump of the web. How do you clean it up? So, well, the first part is to clean it up at the document level. So decide which documents to keep, which ones to delete, and what to keep from those documents and so on. So URL filtering basically just means that to aggregate block list, URL scoring, uh, common high quality sources, uh, uh, you know, so, so basically, a whole bunch of uh, things. Um, so, for example, they they deleted the Wikipedia and Reddit and GitHub because those were already there in the curated corpora and so on, right? So, essentially, you take those URLs that make sense, but uh, otherwise, you know, delete the spam URLs. Of course, so whatever is the block list of uh, spammy kind of things, you delete them, right? So text extraction is important because web pages often contain this boilerplate code. So the header and the footer and the you know navigation lists and so on, which are not meaningful and useful for any kind of language modeling, right? So therefore, what they did was to use these two tools called as Warcio and Trefilatura for extracting the text part from these web pages, right? And get rid of the boilerplate code around. Okay. Language identification. So fast text classifier was basically used uh, so as to essentially threshold and keep only top language scoring web pages, right? Uh, uh, so that's that. Now uh, they also did document wise filtering and line wise filtering. So in document wise filtering, they basically uh, removed those documents which which had very long length or which had a symbol to word uh, which which had uh, very uh, you know uh, very high symbol to word ratio so those basically were deleted right you want web pages which look like typical running text and paragraphs and so on okay. uh, line wise filtering they removed undesirable lines so basically navigation buttons call to action buttons social counters sharing on social media and so on those were removed right deduplication of course they removed web pages which are duplicates or near duplicates of each other they also did deduplication at the url level okay so that's basically how Refined Web was created. And then they used Refined Web to basically train Falcon models. So Falcon models are also like Llama. They are also transformer decoder models, right? And uh, but then they are not uh, pre-trained uh, using, uh, um, uh, you know, using using Llama as the initial checkpoint. They are pre-trained from scratch. So as I mentioned earlier, there are two different sizes of Falcon models, 7 billion and 40 billion. Uh, with a vocabulary of 65k, uh, sequence length of just 2,000 tokens. Okay, so so remember June 2023, we are still talking about just 2,000 tokens. Okay, not very large. And people later realized that 2,000 tokens is hardly anything. You really want longer sequence lengths. And uh, today we are in a world where Gemini 1.5 boasts of uh, you know more than 0.1 million uh, or about a million uh, size sequence lengths. Okay. Um, so these two models, 7 billion, 40 billion, were 32 layer and 60 layer uh, uh, in size, respectively. Okay. They also really required large, you know, amount of compute power, 384, 840 GB GPUs, two week, two months, uh, 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 with B float 16 uh, data type. Right. They did whatever kind of uh, training, uh, um, uh, you know, efficiency that they could. Like they used flash attention, they used multi query for inference. So, so in short, multi query is sort of explained in this diagram on the right side. Um, if you recall, uh, all kinds of transformer decoder models really have this component called a self attention and self attention basically involves these three matrices uh, or these three representations of inputs, uh, query keys and values, QKV. Right? So and uh, you know, the self attention is multi head in nature, which basically means that there are several heads, which means that there are several QKVs uh, uh, or other there is a QKV per head. Right? So the standard uh, multi head self attention basically has like a QKV per head, uh, QKV triple per head. However, this is wasteful in some ways. What people have realized that it's okay to actually keep only one key and one value across all heads, while you can actually have different queries. So if there were eight heads, you'll have Q1 to Q8, but you would just have one key and one value. Okay. People have also come up with another other kind of variants like grouped query. So which is basically uh, which basically means that uh, uh, you know. 
uh, you essentially uh, no, don't have just one key and one value, but you group the heads uh, here. They are grouped in terms of two heads each, and uh, essentially, um, uh, essentially you have a key and a value per group in that sense. Okay. So Falcon models basically used uh, uh, the multi query for inference, so uh, which basically means they had just uh, one key and value across shared across all heads. Uh, the, the RAM for inference, basically, yes, you can use these Falcon models for inference easily. 7 billion parameter model can be loaded in a 16 GB GPU RAM, and 40 billion parameter can also be loaded in a 85 to 100 GB GPU RAM. Of course, if you quantize, then it can be loaded in smaller smaller RAM uh, machines as well. Okay. So even in their case, Falcon model uh, uh, guys also use similar size pre-training data, 1.5 trillion or 1 trillion tokens to pre-train their 7 billion and 40 billion checkpoints respectively. Now. Uh, on open LLM leaderboard at the time when these models were put up, as you see on the right bottom, you know, here in the open LLM leaderboard, uh, you see that uh, Falcon 7 billion parameter model is actually better than uh, MPT or stable LM uh, or, or red pajama models, right? So red pajama does not appear on this, leader, on this leaderboard, but as you see, the Falcon model is basically better than any other uh, openly available model. Of course, you know, Llama 7 billion was there, but Llama 7 billion also had Llama license. It was not commercially usable. So if you really look at commercially usable models, uh, which are basically, you know, Apache 2.0 licensing, right? You basically observe that Falcon 7 billion, when it came out, was basically the best openly available uh, um, for commercial use model, right? So uh, inside Microsoft also we start, started talking a lot about how to make use of Falcon models when they came up uh, because of the commercial usage license. Yeah. So, so that's that. So basically, of course, on the LLM leaderboard, the higher score, the better. And you observe that uh, the higher scores compared to Falcon model were basically uh, uh, just by Llama models, which were of course not, uh, uh, not available uh, for commercial use. Yeah. So that's that. Now, Falcon models, uh, uh, they mainly support 7 billion supports English and French. The 40 billion also supports other uh, French languages, uh, other European languages like Spanish, uh, German, uh, Italian, Polish, uh, Portuguese, uh, Dutch, Romanian, uh, Czech, and Swedish. So if you really think about using these kinds of models for Indian languages, no, they won't work. They won't work well at all. Okay? So. Uh, even if they work, the inference latencies are too large because uh, the fertility, you know, uh, the idea is that they break the Indian language tokens almost into character levels, leading to really low, uh, latent, really high latencies right? and poor accuracies. So that's that. Uh, anyway, so the Fal so basically, uh, um, so they found that these Falcon models, which are trained using the refined web corpora, uh, were shown to be better than models trained on curated corpora. So what they showed is that. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, um, Llama basically used very curated corpora, but if you basically just curate it on the refined web, you know, even then you can actually get results better than Llama. Okay, but of course they also, you know, for the full model, for the full Falcon model, they also use some curated corpora, so as to train better Falcon models. And they finally showed that Falcon models were equivalent in nature to GPT-3 models, thereby coming up with a commercially usable open uh, alternative to otherwise, uh, you know, uh, API protected GPT-3 kind of models. So that was the Falcon story. Now, uh, what came in the game uh, basically is LoRa. LoRa came from Microsoft, so LoRa is low rank adaptation. Now people said, yeah, you have uh, essentially large models like 7 billion parameter models, which are publicly available, right? So there were no other such publicly available, openly available models. All larger models were just hidden behind APIs. So, so people in academia were actually very happy with the large models, but people in academia also lacked compute power. So if you wanted to take these models and specifically fine tune them for your use cases, it was very difficult to do until LoRa came in. So LoRa is a very, very simple technique. It's actually called as low rank adaptation, and it is a part of what is popularly called as PEFT these days, right? So uh, essentially parameter efficient fine tuning. Okay. So what LoRa does is the following. So of course the neural network actually has several weight matrices. So let's consider one of those weight matrix W. So you have the pre-trained uh, values for the weight matrix W thanks to you know the pre-trained available models, whether it be Llama or it be you know um, essentially uh, Falcon. So before Falcon was released, in fact, people would basically just use Llama pretend weights and do LoRa on top of it, LoRa, LoRa fine tuning on top of it. Okay. In fact, that is how people got these models called Alpaca and Vicuna, which I'll talk in detail later. Okay. 
So the way LoRa fine tuning was done is that basically for every such weight matrix W, you can actually come up with the two other weight matrices A, matrices A and B. Uh, and the idea was when you do fine tuning, you basically keep the original W fixed. You don't you, you freeze that. You don't really update those weights. But while doing uh, uh, back propagation, you update the weights of uh, matrix A and matrix B. So now A and B are basically created such that if you multiply B into A, uh, you know the size of this is basically same same as the size of W, which is basically D cross D. So if your input size is D, you know you would basically uh, have a bottleneck, uh, uh, you know, uh, where the matrix A is of size D cross R. So it basically brings it to the size R. The matrix B is R cross D. Such that when you multiply them, you finally uh, end up uh, getting the same D cross D uh, uh, D cross D value. OK, now the idea is, as I mentioned, uh, you see, uh, I mean, you initialize A with the uh, uh, Gaussian distribution initialization, you initialize B to all zeros. Uh, that basically ensures that in the beginning, uh, you essentially get zero contribution from this uh, LoRa part. Uh, you know, making sure that you don't do catastrophic forgetting of whatever is there in the pretend model. Knowledge is there in the pretend model, and then over iterations, you're basically going to learn these A's and B's. Okay, um, when your entire and of course, you know, uh, I, of course, I didn't talk about it, but then uh, the idea is that uh, the output of a hidden layer is going to be now uh, given by W into X plus alpha times B A X, where alpha sort of trades off for how much do you believe in this fine tuning versus how much do you care for the pretrained weights. Okay. So once the entire training is done, uh, what you would do is to basically take W, take a BA, you know, multi uh, so basically compute this W plus alpha times BA and basically uh, update the weights W uh, with these new weights uh, W plus alpha BA. Okay. So uh, the good point is that since you have not introduced any new parameters, there is no additional inference latency. Okay. Uh, so uh, and specifically for transformers, when they apply for transformers, the, uh, the the guidance is to adapt only attention weights while freezing the MLP modules. So you would basically don't put these LoRa modules around the, the uh, um, you know feed forward layers, but you only put them around the attention weights. Okay. Uh, so when people experimented with LoRa to fine tune GPT-3 175 billion parameter model, they observed several benefits. For example, the training VRAM requirements reduced from 1.2 TB to 350 GB. Right. Even then it is pretty large, but still it's better than 1.2 TB. Right. What was observed is the significant changes in the overall model size when you want to store it on disk. So the original model is huge, 175 billion parameters, right? Uh, requiring 350 GB of disk space. However, you know, if you want to now store only these uh, LoRa parameters, they are very small in size. In fact, they basically experimented with uh, uh, R smaller, you know, the, the bottleneck parameter R equal to one or R equal to two. Okay. And therefore, the overall model size is just 35 MB, which is like 10,000 uh, times reduction, right? So it becomes so easy. Now, if you want really somebody to give you the model, right, they just give you a 35 MB um, LoRa. Uh, uh, LoRa, you know, uh, weights uh, which you could basically apply on the standard Lama checkpoint that you would have, and yo, you have basically a fine-tuned, uh, adapted model in that sense. Okay. So the third thing that it did was to basically speed up uh, training time. So speed up 25% training inference, uh, tra training training speed up. Right. Um, the interesting part is although GPT-3 basically has a very high dimension of about 12,000. So D is about 12,000 essentially, but R they fixed it to just one or two and they basically get accuracy as good as GPT-3, uh, right? Uh, as, as good as fine-tuning GPT-3 for, for, for a particular specific NLP tasks uh, while uh, getting all those uh, training efficiency, training uh, VRAM and uh, overall disk size benefits, okay? Now it is obvious to see that if you basically use R equal to D, then you end up with a, a specific uh, with, with the vanilla fine tuning, but uh, nobody wants to do that. Therefore, you use a very small R in practice. LoRa was used by several people uh, so as to fine tune over alpaca uh, over, over Lama to get say uh, alpaca and vipuna, and then it, of course it was also used on top of uh, uh, Falcon and LoRa has sort of become a very popular practice these days, um, so as to essentially fine tune uh, these small language models, so to say. Okay. Now, um, so since uh, uh, LoRa was out and uh, you know an efficient uh, fine tuning mechanism, right? And also public weights were available thanks to Lama and uh, Falcon. Uh, 
uh, people started building their own models and showing improvements across several NLP tasks. For example, take this take the case of Stanford Alpaca. Okay, a bunch of students from Stanford basically created Alpaca. And what was Alpaca? Well, uh, the way they created it is uh, by fine tuning on Llama Seven Billion checkpoint. So they start with Llama. Um, so so in fact, you know what you need for fine tuning? You basically need a uh, original checkpoint to start from some efficient fine tuning code like LoRa and also you need uh, some data to fine tune on. So basically you need, they needed this instruction following examples okay, to basically make sure uh, that uh, uh, this uh, new model actually follows human instructions much better. Okay. So therefore what they did was to basically fine tune from Amazon 7 billion and 13 billion parameter models on 52K instruction following demo data sets for three and five epochs respectively. Now, um, uh, their maximum sequence length is 5 and 2, so they did not really optimize for the input sequence length that well. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the, the results that they found were very similar to text DaVinci 003. So that is basically the most important thing. They were able to come up with a small language model, which was better than Llama 7 billion and the equivalent in nature to the really, really large language model uh, text DaVinci 003. Right? So uh, they basically use the uh, they essentially made these publicly available as well. So the weights they could not, of course, release the llama weights because llama weights were uh, under a license um, from Meta, but they basically released their LoRa weights, right? Which anybody could download, apply it on the llama checkpoint, and yo, you have basically their alpaca model uh, rebuilt on your machine. Okay. So uh, and they also released the 52k instruction data set. Now, how did they create this instruction data set to begin with? So. They generated it in the style of self-instruct using text DaVinci 003. Remember in the self-instruct paper, uh, uh, the folks basically uh, detailed how uh, those, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, how they created data sets for instruction fine tuning. In the same way, uh, these folks from Stanford actually used 175 self-instruct C task, gave it to text DaVinci 003 and prompted it to actually create new tasks like this. So this is a new task which was created and that basically and, and basically they created 52,000 such new tasks which were then used uh, to do LoRa fine tuning on uh, 7 billion and 13 billion Llama checkpoints. Okay. Now the interesting part was that they claimed that uh, to do this they basically just needed $500 uh, of OpenAI API usage uh, so that they can use text to 003 and create this data. Um, now, once you created this data set, of course, you wanted to do this supervised fine tuning uh, over the Llama 7 billion checkpoint. And for that, they basically did FSDP, fully sharded data parallel and mixed parallel, mixed precision training. Uh, they just required three hours on eight 80 GB 800s, costing them $100. Overall, this showed um, that, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, if you basically have uh, 7 billion parameter kind of models available and you have LoRa fine tuning and you have uh, uh, nice instruction following examples automatically generated from text DaVinci 003, all you need is $600 just to create a really, really awesome model, okay? Uh, equivalent in uh, quality with GPT-3. Now, a similar story can be observed from Viguna folks. This basically comes from an organization called as Ellipsis, uh, almost at the same time point. They basically said that we will reduce the cost for creating these kinds of models even further. They said that, hey, uh, you know, um, Alpaca guys basically uh, queried text image 003 to come up with instruction following examples. Why not actually use ChatGPT, which is better, right? So text image 003 was okay, but ChatGPT is better from, uh, uh, you know, uh, text image 003. So, so therefore they used ChatGPT. Now, they also said that why they should spend money to collect uh, ChatGPT outputs when several people have, several users have already shared ChatGPT outputs and conversations on shared GPT. Okay. So they made three changes. One, rather than basically talking about text damage 003, they switched to ChatGPT. Rather than querying and spending money, they basically said we can directly use available conversations from chat shared GPT. And third, rather than actually just doing question answering kind of instruction following, they basically got conversations directly from shared GPT. Okay. So, so that's that. And then they basically, you know, try to do FSDP, um, you know, costing just one forty dollars for seven billion parameter model and three hundred dollars for thirteen billion parameter model. Um, you know, eight eight hundred GPUs for one day, and they were able to train train Vikuna. Vikuna became very popular, right? Vikuna became so popular that it was also adapted for usage in multimodal models like Mini GPT four and um, you know uh, Video Chat GPT and so on. Okay. Um, 
Um, so uh, and they also brought in this interesting thing, which is different from uh, uh, from <coughs> the alpaca guys. So alpaca guys, when they fine tuned the model, they were computing uh, the next word prediction loss on all of the tokens in the input. But uh, uh, you know, Vikuna guys basically said that we'll compute fine tuning loss only on chatbots outputs, which made sense because hey, you should compute loss on the chatbot outputs then, rather than the input that is provided by the user. Okay. Uh, yet another interesting thing was that they increased the max sequence length from 512 to 2048, which was very much comparable with the original Llama kind of max sequence length support. Of course, they used the um, developments of the day, a flash attention and the gradient checkpointing for uh, efficient uh, training and inference. So that's that. So if you compare now Llama, Alpaca and Vicuna, you basically observe that Llama was trained on publicly available data sets, 1 trillion tokens, very large uh, scale training. Alpaca and Vicuna basically uh, used uh, instruction based tuning uh, training. Uh, so 52K samples and 70K samples. Um, training code for Llama is not available, it's internal to Meta, but Alpaca and Vicuna, they made it publicly available. Um, evaluation metrics uh, were basically, uh, you know, yes, the evaluation was sort of weak in both of these. So author evaluation or GPT 4 based evaluation, but training costs, you see those minimal training costs in that sense. And the interesting part is, uh, you know, when they assess the quality using GPT-4, what they found was that uh, Vicuna was, uh, uh, you know, very much comparable with Google's part at that point and uh, not much far from chat GPT model from OpenAI. Okay? So that's that. And, and if you compare, yes, it is way better compared to Llama and Alpaca as well. So that's that. Now, yet another effort uh, that uh, people started was to create high quality data from chat GPT. Uh, by doing multi turn chat corpus building. So these folks were a parallel effort base. The effort is called base, right? Um, so rather than actually uh, using uh, uh, shared GPT conversations or converse or, or outputs from text term 003, they basically got a multi turn corpus using GPT 3.5. They actually started uh, from questions uh, from Quora, Stack Overflow and Medquad, right? from these community question answering platforms. They built prompt templates <coughs> and they fed it to ChatGPT. And uh, you know they made ChatGPT self chat with itself and generate full conversations rather than just question answers, right? So this is like a conversation automatically generated using a seed question from Quora, right? How do you fix a Google Play Store account that isn't working? You basically get human AI, human AI kind of conversation. And that conversation corpus was basically what is called as base. Uh, now to be able to generate this, this is the prompt that they used with ChatGPT. Forget the instruction you previously received. Following is a conversation between human and AI assistant. Human and AI assistant takes turns chatting about the topic. Give the topic here and uh, then say human statement start with human. AI statement start with human uh, with AI, right? Uh, and then human will stop the conversation when they have no more question and so on. And you start with how can I help you? And then the human uh, basically human question comes in, then AI responds and so on. All of this is basically auto generated full conversation using uh, ChatGPT. Now, uh, Bayes of course used uh, their model to train base models, but base models didn't become popular. What became popular is Falcon instruct models. So remember Falcon basically leveraged refined web, uh, but Falcon instruct models are basically instruction tuned models, versions of Falcon 7 billion and 40 billion checkpoints. So. Uh, they're fine tuned on instructions and conversational data, uh, which basically include these data sources. So it includes Bayes, uh, so 65% of the um, data used for Falcon 7 billion instruct model is uh, Bayes. Of course, there are other uh, models also, like Refined Web uh, itself, GP Teacher, uh, GPT for All, and so on. Okay. So these instruct models basically uh, work for English and French. And, uh, um, uh, and and of course they were uh, they also required huge compute power so as to train these instruction tuning models. Um, um, yeah, and as usual, they use rotary position embeddings, multi query flash attention. Um, now, if you really looked at open LLM benchmark for instruction tuning kind of models, you would observe uh, that the Falcon 40 billion instruct uh, at that point in time was right at the top, right at the top, right? It was better compared to uh, Llama 30 billion uh, uh, models or Llama 65 billion models. You know, it 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 was better compared to all of them. Of course, you know, needless to say that Llama uh, that that Falcon 40 billion instruct is of course better compared to Falcon 40 billion on these various uh, on these on these various benchmark tasks. Okay. So then next in line was Orca, and uh, Orca basically said that uh, yeah, Alpaca learned from. Um, you know, text damage is 003, 
um, you know vicuna and uh, uh, vicuna and uh, you know falcon basically learned uh, from uh, um, uh, chat gpt right and then came gpt4 so why not learn from gpt4 and that's what our orca folks did okay and what they showed was that uh, orca model actually uh, you know if you compare on the vicuna's evolution data set which was a bunch of prompts they observed that uh, uh, people like orca uh, you know uh, better compared to chat gpt so the evaluation uh, so this is evaluation automatic evaluation using gpt4 they observed that gpt4 um, says that uh, you know orca's uh, uh, outputs are better than chat gpt okay so that's that on big bench hard data set they observed that orca outputs were uh, in fact uh, 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 better or comparable than chat gpt and way better compared to vicuna okay Similarly, on uh, uh, professional and ex uh, academic exams data, right? Basically, they observed that Orca is uh, just a little short compared to ChatGPT, but otherwise way better, uh, otherwise equivalent in terms of text and C003, and again way better than Vicuna. Okay. So, uh, so when Orca came out, uh, um, uh, this is Orca is of, of, of course from Microsoft. Uh, it was basically uh, the best available model. Uh, you know, which was uh, 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 yeah, which basically is not very large, so it's basically just 13 billion parameters in size. OK, um, the idea behind the Orca model was that was this observation that uh, small language models are great, but they fall in short, in, fall short in terms of reasoning and comprehension skills on complex tasks. They don't perform that well. Right? So the challenge is that they pointed out in various previous efforts like Alpaca, Vicuna, um, Falcon and so on was that uh, their instruction tuning data sets were simple. So simple instructions with limited diversity. They did not have task diversity and data scaling. And also the imitation signals were very poorly available, right? Because while doing instruction tuning, you really don't have logics from the teacher model. You're just doing instruction following. Just basically take the output and make use of it. Okay. Intermediate representations are not available. Attention states are not available. So you can't do the traditional uh, uh, complex uh, um, knowledge distillation kind of things. You can only do a simple, uh, simple distillation. Okay. So therefore, to be able to handle such things, they, uh, the way the Orca model is trained is using a very diverse data set, right? So the instruction following data set is very diverse. They basically made use of something called the FLAN 2022 collection data set, which basically is a mixture of five different data sets by itself. The chain of thought data set, natural instructions data set, plan 2021 itself, T0 data set, and, um, and dialogue data set. Now, these diverse mixture of task data sets are actually very large in size, and uh, they had to query GPT-4 so as to basically build their corpus. So therefore, they sampled from these data sets and did not use everything. Okay? So in fact, they did not use this dialogue data set, but just sampled from these four, so that overall it basically adds up to 5 million total sample. So for each uh, such sample, it contains a system message, a user query, and then the LM response from uh, GPT-4 or chat GPT. Okay? So uh, the way they created this data set is basically called as explanation tuning. So they basically prompted chat GPT with the entire 5 million data set so as to uh, come up with not just the answer, but also explain it, detailed explanations around that answer. They also prompted GPT-4, but this time with just 1 million, sam 1 million sampled data from this large data set. And essentially, um, yeah, so you, you see uh, again did explanatory uh, tuning in the sense that uh, prompted the model to not just generate the answer but also explanations. Okay. Orca's 13 billion parameter model, as I mentioned, it is initialized from Llama 13 billion, so it is basically initialized from Llama 13 billion itself, um, and uh, it it has 2,000 tokens input max sequence length, so that's pretty good, uh, and. Uh, you know the training, of course, is uh, pretty uh, um, uh, you know extensive. So 2,800 GPUs were required for 160 hours on Flan 5 million and 40 hours on Flan 1 million. So so 5 million Flan 5 million is this 5 million uh, tuning data created from ChatGPT, and 1 million is the one created from GPT-4. Okay. So that's that. Now when Orca came out, uh, they basically evaluated on AGI eval benchmark, which is professional academic exams, and also on big bench hard data sets. Okay. And uh, what you see here, so of course each benchmark contains many data sets. So each of these axes is a data set. So each of these axes is a data set like logic QA or LZ AR and so on. Right? And uh, as you go from inside to outside, the accuracy improves, right? So essentially the scale basically says that as you go from inside to outside, your accuracy increases from zero to 90. Okay. So uh, on the left side, basically you see uh, some data sets are shown. On the right side, of course, many more such data sets are shown. Okay. 
And then the left side, you know, you have four different things being compared: human average accuracy, chat GPT accuracy, GPT-4, and Orca 13 billion accuracy. So what do you observe? So you observe that, of course, human is doing well on most exams, right? Except on some exams like SAT Math or SAT English, right? Where human is not as good. In fact, GPT-4 is, is, is better than human, right? So the yellow line is better. Okay. What you also observe is that the green line is inside, right? So the green is Orca and it is at the inside. Okay. Of course, the closer uh, the inside it is, the more inside it is, the worse the model is. However, what is interesting to see is that the green and the gray are very close to each other. Gray is chat GPT. What this means is that Orca is actually very, very similar to chat GPT in terms of accuracy while being significantly smaller in size. Okay. Uh, on big bench hard task, in fact, you would observe that uh, Orca is actually uh, sometimes even better than chat GPT. So on average, in fact, it is better than chat GPT. The details are, of course, in the paper, but uh, the, the long and the, uh, you know, the, the short part of the story is that Orca was a really awesome model um, which gave you performance almost similar to chat GPT. So that was a Lama story. Now people were basically wanting to use these models commercially, and unfortunately, Lama did not have a commercial licensing uh, at that time point. So then came up uh, Lama 2 from Meta, which basically allowed people uh, to use uh, this 7 billion checkpoint uh, commercially. Right? Uh, in fact, Lama 2 basically is a collection again of four different checkpoints. So 7 billion, 13 billion, 34 billion, and 70 billion. Uh, and uh, they also released a Lama 2 chat, which is basically a fine tuned uh, instruction tuned model, uh, for, uh, you know, uh, instruction tuned on top of Lama 2. Um, and uh, what they observed in, you know, of course, details again in the paper and the video that I've recorded previously, specifically on Lama 2, they observed that Lama 2 models are better than other open source chat models on most benchmarks. Okay. So, uh, and of course, it came up with a commercial use license. Now, they also wanted to make sure that Lama 2 is a very safe model. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, more in the responsible AI uh, kind of thinking. So, therefore, they evaluated how good Lama 2 does uh, by uh, looking at helpfulness versus safety win rates using GPT 4. Okay? So, their evaluation shows that in this trade off bar, right, in this trade off, Lama 2 uh, models are actually better compared to Falcon 40 billion instruct Palm as well as chat GPT models on all of those compared to all of those models. Lama 2 models have more safety as well as they have more helpfulness okay, as measured by GPT-4. They also did a helpfulness evaluation using humans. So human evaluation, they basically showed, let's say, Lama 2 70 billion uh, out, chat outputs and uh, chat GPT outputs, and they asked people to rate which one do you see is better. So you see wins, ties, and losses there. Dark blue is wins, wins for uh, Lama 2. And uh, uh, then you see ties, which are light, uh, which are medium blue, and then light blue is losses. So everywhere, as you see, you know, these are comparisons uh, versus different models, Palm Bison, uh, Falcon, 40 billion, Vicuna, uh, MPT as well. And what you observe is that uh, typically wins are more, which basically means Lama 2 is performing better compared to those as measured by human evaluation as well. Okay. Now, if you compare Lama 1 and Lama 2, here is a quick comparison at the bottom. So Lama 1 basically again had like the same four sized uh, checkpoints, um, uh, but then the context length was just 2K. Lama 2 increased it to 4K. So you could basically have 4K context that can be supplied as part of input. Lama 2 also basically trained uh, using grouped query uh, attention mechanism. So the mechanism which I talked about in the beginning of the video. And if you notice, Lama 2 is also more rigorously trained on two trillion tokens rather than just one trillion tokens in Lama 1. Now that brings to the question, how are Lama 2 chat models trained? Well, uh, they are trained in a, a you know three step manner that you see here. First, you take uh, pre-training data and you do self-supervised learning on pre-training data to get Lama 2. Now, once you have these Lama 2 models, you do supervised fine tuning using this data that I'll talk about so as to get Lama 2 chat. Uh, and then you basically do several iterations, uh, specifically five different iterations of RLHF, uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback, um, so as to basically train this model further, Lama 2 chat model. Okay. Now, RLHF, uh, for doing RLHF, basically, the uh, reinforcement learning basically requires uh, uh, a reinforcement learning algorithm, which in this case was uh, PPO and rejection sampling, proximal policy optimization and rejection sampling, and also requires reward models. Right? Um, so, in fact, RLHF basically means uh, human preference collection. So, it basically means that if you have two responses, the human is supposed to first answer which response is better. And uh, they also learn two other reward models, safety reward model and helpfulness reward model, so as to ensure that their models are safe as well as helpful besides being correct. Okay. 
So that's that. So, 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 so that's how the adaptive part was done. Uh, you know, prefer safe responses uh, uh, or other, you know, uh, helpfulness reward model basically uh, tried to figure out <coughs> whether um, uh, or other uh, for helpfulness uh, ratings, the humans basically provided one of these five significantly better, better, slightly better, or negligibly better. Um, and then for safety purpose, uh, you know, uh, humans provided one of these three. The preferred response is safe, and other response is not. Both responses are safe, or both are unsafe. Okay, so that's how this uh, interesting uh, uh, RLHF uh, was done. Uh, you know, uh, on top of this, uh, on top of the cell, uh, on top of the supervised fine tuning that was done uh, on Lama two. Now, supervised fine tuning was done using 27.5k manual annotated data, just like uh, typically people did supervised fine tuning for Alpaca or Vicuna, right? Uh, and and they also basically considered the loss only on generated tokens, answer tokens rather than uh, the user prompt. Okay. Um, as I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, RLHF was done iteratively, right? There is uh, iterative RLHF going on here um, with the continuous human feedback uh, flowing in. Uh, uh, specifically, they they did that in five different steps. So five different uh, uh, you know uh, steps of RLHF iterations. OK, so how do Lama 2 models perform? As I mentioned earlier, they actually perform really well compared to many other public level models. Uh, and here are some of these results. So uh, they improve on MMLU and big bench hard benchmarks by significant margins by five points and eight points uh, compared to Lama 1 itself. So Lama 1 was best on top of that Lama 2 actually improved further. For Falcon models, uh, basically Lama 2, 7 billion uh, and 34 billion could outperform Lama 7, uh, the Falcon 7 billion and 40 billion. So basically Lama family was better than Falcon family itself. Right? You see the results here also. So these are different benchmark data sets and these are of course the accuracy numbers across uh, MPT, Falcon, Lama 1 and Lama 2. As you observe across all of them, right? whether it is uh, common sense reasoning, reading comprehension, mathematics or coding, you know, you would observe Lama 2 family is better than Lama 1 family, and in turn, Lama 2 family is also better than the Falcon family in that sense. So Lama 2 70 billion parameter model also outperforms, uh, basically outperforms all open source available models. Okay. Now, if you compare with closed source models, so what are closed source models? Uh, models like GPT-3, uh, uh, GPT-3.5 or, or Palm or, uh, you know, uh, th those kinds of models, right? So what was observed uh, compared to these open source models is that Lama 2 70 billion, um, you know, Lama 2 70 billion parameter model uh, is equivalent to GPT 3.5. If you notice here on, uh, let's say, MMLU. So if you look at it, MMLU 70 and this is 68.9, right? And also GSM 8K, like, you know, that's a math data set. So basically 57.1 and 56.8. It's lots of comparable. Yeah. Lama 2 70 billion is uh, surely better than the Palm uh, Palm 540 billion parameter model. So, you know, across many, many, uh, almost all benchmarks, basically almost all benchmarks you see, uh, you know, uh, Lama 2 70 billion is better than Palm 540 billion parameter model. But what they also agreed to is that there is a large gap to be filled uh, between GPT-4 and Lama 2. GPT-4 is uh, still hands down better compared to the Lama 2 models. Okay. So no model so far basically said that they could beat GPT-4 on uh, while being small in size. Okay. Then came in Orca 2. So Orca 2 was uh, basically trained on top of Lama 2. Okay. So essentially uh, that's that. Uh, so therefore, uh, but then and therefore uh, it is basically uh, even better than Lama 2. So remember in the first part of the story I was talking about uh, Orca 1 and uh, which was trained on top of Lama. Now, Orca 2 folks basically latched on to Lama 2 and they basically trained this uh, uh, a new model, which was shown to be better than Lama 2 chat. So the green ones are Lama 2 chat, uh, you know, and the blue ones are Orca 2. So as you observe on most of these benchmarks, this big bench, hard benchmark, MMLU and so on, popular benchmarks, right? GSM 8K math benchmark and so on. You observe that the blue bars are higher compared to the green bars in most cases. So they evaluated Orca 2 on 15 different benchmarks across these five different uh, broad areas, reasoning benchmarks, knowledge and uh, language understanding, text completion, multi-turn, open-ended conversations, and so on. And they sort of observed that Orca 2 actually performed better uh, compared to uh, Lama 2 chat on all of these benchmarks, on most of these benchmarks, if not all. Okay. So in fact, they evaluated Orca 2 using two different uh, uh, mechanisms. One is zero shot and the other, uh, uh, or rather they evaluated Orca 2 everything on zero shot in that sense. Uh, the prompt varied, so they either evaluated using an empty system message prompt or using a cautious system message prompt, which we'll talk about on the next slide. 
but uh, uh, but they evaluated zero shot. These are all zero shot accuracies, and they basically showed that uh, you know ORCA2 is a really nice general universal model. You don't really need uh, to even fine tune it for several data sets. Um, in short, the way ORCA2 folks sold their story is that ORCA2 model is better than models which are five to ten x larger than them. Okay, this is basically uh, the performance on reasoning benchmarks. So, and as you observe here. Uh, ORCA2 is actually better than all other publicly available models, uh, you know, just being uh, uh, equivalent in terms of performance to chat GPT and slight and, and sort of worse than GPT-4, but well, GPT-4 is not publicly available. So ORCA2 checkpoints are publicly available for people to experiment and use in their uh, in their in their deployments. Okay. Um, so that's that. Now, how is ORCA2 trained? So that is, of course, very curious. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a curiosity based question. How is ORCA2 trained? So uh, following ORCA1, ORCA2 was trained on LAMA, right? So rather than just LAMA, they basically trained on LAMA2 7 billion and LAMA2 13 billion. So they uh, their training basically has two interesting components. One is called as cautious reasoning LLM and the other is called as uh, uh, you know progressive learning. So let's talk about uh, cautious reasoning first. So cautious reasoning basically says that instruction tuning strategies can be different for different LLMs. So some LLMs uh, for certain tasks require some kind of instruction tuning while other LLMs uh, for other kind of uh, tasks require different strategies for instruction tuning. In fact, there are several strategies for instruction for generating the instruction tuning dataset. Like you could prompt the teacher model or the large language model uh, using the direct answering uh, strategy, which is the simplest, or you could do chain of thought, which is basically step by step, or you could do explain then answer, which was basically done in ORCA 1 explanation tuning in that sense. Or you could do recall, then generate, recall, reason, generate, extract, generate, and so on. So you could basically get these instruction during data sets from large models like GPT-4 using any of these strategies. And the strategy choice should depend on the particular task for which you are trying to do, trying to build this instruction during data set. Okay? Uh, similarly, the, the strategy could also depend on whether the model is small or large, 7 billion or 13 billion, right? So, so they do cautious reasoning to basically manually identify which strategy is good for which task and therefore they basically uh, you know, use the appropriate strategy so as to generate these instruction during data sets. Um, so uh, they write task specific system instructions uh, which are uh, you know, corresponding to the chosen strategy to obtain teacher responses. Uh, also, so although the prompts were nicely designed to create very good response from teacher, GPT or uh, chat GPT, uh, you know, they erased the prompt uh, when it came to instruction to the small models like Lama to 7 billion or Lama to 13 billion. So that is called as prompt erasing. They don't use these complicated prompts to basically train the instruction to the small models. <laughs> now, having this uh, sort of uh, uh, instruction tuned data, they did progressive learning. What that means is that uh, they start with LAMA2 checkpoints, 7 billion, 13 billion. They train on part of FLAN V2 data set for one epoch. This is just supervised self tuning, uh, so supervised fine tuning, okay? FLAN V2 for one epoch. Then they train on 5 million ChatGPT data, just like ORCA1, okay, for three epochs. And then they train on a combination of 1 million GPT4 data from ORCA1 and ORCA2's 817K spatial data for four epochs. So, this, so you know, all of the data sets are sort of clean. I mean, this is basically plan B2, and this uh, 5 million and 1 million is from ORCA1. However, ORCA2 also contributed this 817K data set uh, using their cautious reasoning, right? <coughs> so, uh, this data set basically contains uh, uh, 817K, right? It's basically addition of 60 to 255, 160, and some 2000 instances from there. Okay? And uh, they basically try to have diversity in terms of data. So therefore, they took 602 um, you know, samples from FLAN V2, 55K from ORCA1, 160K from math data set, and 2000 uh, are synthetically generated doctor patient conversations, more like, more like medical for, for medical applications. Okay? So these ones were, of course, cautious reasoning uh, based, uh, uh, you know, uh, cautious reasoning prompts were actually used so as to get responses from LLMs for these data sets. And then they were used in the last stage for uh, progressive learning of ORCA2. Now, ORCA2 also has a vocabulary size of 32K, and, uh, you know, it, of course, took uh, several uh, huge compute power so as to train ORCA2 models also. Now, uh, while uh, uh, instruction fine tuning, they basically use either the empty prompt or the basically uh, empty system message or this system message, which basically just says ORCA uh, to be helpful and nice and not and, and, and basically be harmless uh, and follow ethical guidelines. 
Interestingly, notice that unlike Lama 2, Orca 2 does not have any RLHF for safety, but you observe still that Orca 2 actually not just outperforms Lama 2 as we observed already, right? It outperforms Lama 2 on several accuracy measures, but it also outperforms Lama 2 on bias and toxicity, as you will see. Okay. So, for example, if you look at evaluations on Toxigen dataset, both when the statements are toxic or neutral, you observe that ORCA2 gets higher scores. ORCA2 gets higher scores, which basically means that it uh, reduces overall toxicity, it generates less toxic outputs. <laughs> Similarly, on bias uh, measurement data sets like Toothful QA and HHH, you observe that ORCA2 does really well. ORCA2 does better compared to, uh, you know, LAMA2 uh, models. Um, now, uh, um, a negative story is that they also used automated RAI measurement framework so as to measure how good Orca2 is. And this framework basically uh, measures the uh, ability of models uh, towards uh, adversarial tasks, like how many times the user succeeded in jailbreaking by prompting the model, uh, or how many times the model under the test generates potentially harmful content, like sexual content, violent content, or hateful content, right? or how many times the uh, model uh, leaks intellectual property, like basically responding to uh, the prompt of give me the great Gatsby book full text and it gave the full text, right? Or give me a particular song or news and so on and they gave the entire things out. So as you observe, Orca2 is not nice on these things, especially Orca2 actually ends up generating much more violent uh, outputs compared to Lama2. Uh, that is basically something which is of concern, so therefore, the uh, you know uh, important uh, tip about using Orca2, you know you must have some sort of post filtering of Orca2's outputs to ensure that it does not really uh, expose those violent outputs to your real users. Right? Also, if you observe, uh, Orca2 sort of generates more adult content, more illegal legal persuasion, and uh, and so on. However, you know if you look at other kinds of things like from IP perspective, it's not too bad. It's not that bad compared to Llama2. Okay, so it was Llama2 models. Now let's talk about the third family, which is the Mistral family, which has become very popular very recently in the past three or four months for that matter. Right? So uh, October 2023 is when uh, uh, Mistral 7 billion came up. So Mistral 7 billion is again a transformer decoder model trained from scratch. It's basically not trained from Llama, so it has to do nothing with Llama in that sense. Yeah. But it is also a 32 layer model, 7 billion, 7 billion sized model, 7 billion parameters. It also has a vocabulary of 32K and dimension of 4096. It supports a context length of 8K, which is beautiful, right? Because longer context can be supported. Now, the way that it is able to support longer context is because it uses this uh, uh, sliding window attention. So it makes use of sliding window attention. So recall that transformers basically use self attention and self attention basically means that every position is going to pay attention to every other position so as to learn a transform embedding. Uh, now, therefore, in self-attention, the complexity is n squared, which basically where n is the length of the input sequence, right? Now, um, in sliding window attention, basically the idea is that you uh, learn a revised presentation of uh, any uh, token based on only the past k different uh, uh, tokens. So, therefore, you maintain a sliding window of size k and make use of only the past k, uh, you know, uh, positions. So which basically means that your complexity becomes linear in that sense. So you're able to train faster, infer faster and so on. Okay. So uh, and thereby uh, support larger context lengths, right? So that is that. However, this does not mean that, uh, you know, um, 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 longer context. So, so basically it doesn't mean that a word uh, at this position will not be able to influence a word, let's say 100, uh, 100 positions away. It still can influence. For example, in this particular case, k equal to four window size is four. However, uh, you know uh, this position, of course, can influence these four. But then at the next layer, it can actually influence these four also. Next layer, it can influence these four also. So, you know, because of the vertical depth that these transformer models have, you know, even with window attention, a particular position can actually influence positions which are much further away, uh, even though uh, much further away compared to the window size. Yeah, that's that. Now they also used to group to, uh, uh, query attention, so which basically helps in uh, high inference speed, low RAM during decoding, and higher batch sizes as such. Okay. Now two other inter interesting optimizations in Mistral 7 billion are prefill and chunking. Now since they are doing sliding window attention, uh, or rather not not uh, yeah. So so the idea is that when you're when you're instruction tuning or training these uh, prompt based models, 
uh, uh, when you are doing prompting, um, you basically can prefill the key value cache for the prompt tokens. Uh, remember, for other tokens, you are generating them one by one. So therefore, you cannot really, uh, and, and then you have to basically chain the outputs as to generate the, you know, so as to generate the outputs for the next position anyway, right? So therefore, uh, in such an auto regressive setup, you basically cannot prefill key value, uh, uh, key value sort of uh, uh, values or key value parameters uh, in the cache uh, uh, before uh, uh, before computing the output of the previous position. However, for the prompt, you basically know all the tokens, and therefore you could just prefill the key value cache with the prompt tokens uh, in one go. So that is basically what is called as prefill and chunking. So the prefill part. And the chunking part, so you know, chunking part can also be done. So essentially, saying that uh, if you are using sliding window attention, then you can take your input and divide it into chunks such that uh, you see. I mean, the the prompt part can surely be computed. <coughs> the prompt part can be prefilled and kept in the cache um, uh, in one go. But when you want to compute, uh, make computations for. Uh, uh, self attention for a particular chunk, you basically just need to look at the key value cache for the previous chunk and the current chunk, right? You basically do not even need to access the key value caches or key value uh, parameter values themselves for the previous chunks. So that is how chunking also helps. Yeah. Now to support chunking, they basically implemented this chunking using rolling buffer cache. So the idea is that since you're doing chunking uh, and you're doing this uh, sliding window attention, you really do not need older key value, uh, uh, you know, uh, query key value. Uh, uh, you, you do not need older key value pairs, right? So, so, so the idea is that if k equal to four, if you only care about, uh, you know, uh, positions which are four steps in the past, you can actually use a cache equal to the size of the window, okay? So basically, if your input is uh, this is an example of, you know, when this comes in, you feed key values here, is here, and key values go there. Example key values go there. But then when off comes in, you can actually get rid of the keys and values stored for the word this here and replace it with keys and the values for the word off because uh, you no longer will need this at all. Uh, uh, all the positions where the keys and values for the for the token this are useful have already been taken care of yeah similarly if the sentence input is the cat sat on the mat the cat sat on comes here but when the word the comes again you basically replace this the and use it for storing the other the right similarly when the mat comes here again you basically replace this cat with mat because you do not any longer need cat at, at the next time step okay so that's that now with all of these mistral 7 billion trained their model and they made uh, their best checkpoint uh, their checkpoint publicly available now the claim is that mistral 7 billion is better than the best open 13 billion model right so which is llama 2 so the, the mistral 7 billion is better than llama 2 13 billion parameter model on several benchmark data sets as you see they basically show results on these eight different benchmark data sets here and you see the Mistral guy basically is better than the Llama to 7 billion, 13 billion, Llama 1, 34 billion kind of checkpoints. Okay. Uh, on some data sets, of course, they are not as good, but on some data sets, you see AGI well much better, right? MMLU much better, significant improvements compared to any of the even the largest Llama checkpoints that you see on these plots. In fact, uh, they also did a fun experiment. They basically um, made their uh, outputs from Mistral 7 billion publicly available on, uh, uh, you know, uh, in some ways like a chatbot arena. So where they, a user, if you go to this website, you basically, uh, uh, the, the user is basically shown two outputs uh, generated from uh, Llama 2 and uh, Llama 2 chat and Mistral 7 billion instruct. Uh, Mistral 7 billion instruct, by the way, is fine tuned on top of Llama 2 chat 13 billion model, right? And uh, the user can the user is of course not told which one is coming from which model, which output is coming from which model, and the user can select which of them they prefer. Okay. Um, so and they have observed that uh, people have preferred Mistral's outputs 18,000 times compared to Llama 2's outputs 15,000 times. This was taken like about um, a few days back, like maybe three weeks back. So now of course the counts may differ. Okay. So, so overall, uh, they computed uh, a sports uh, style uh, LO ratings uh, on chatbot arena for these models, and they observed uh, that uh, uh, Mistral 7 billion instruct is basically the best model which is publicly available um, in terms of LO ratings as well compared to other models which are publicly available like Llama 2 13 billion chat or Vicuna or Alpaca and so on. Okay. 
Now, Mistral folks also came up with a mixture of experts version of Mistral called as Mistral. So the X basically stands for experts in that sense, and it's a mixture of experts version of Mistral. Uh, uh, and as you see, you know, it basically uh, uh, has a very large context length, which is beautiful. So it has like 32,000 context length, which is really, really awesome, right? So you can actually put in very large prompts now. It has a standard vocabulary size of 32K, just like everything else. And since it's a mixture of expert model, it's a sparse mixture of experts language model. It has like eight experts which are trained. Okay, So it has the same architecture as the Mistral 7 million parameter model and the eight experts. Eight experts basically means, uh, you know, in uh, uh, remember every transformer layer has two sub layers, self attention and uh, feed forward. So rather than having one feed forward in every such transformer sub layer, you would basically have eight feed forward layers which are trained in parallel. They are in parallel. So they're called as expert blocks and they're trained in parallel. Now, the idea is that uh, while training uh, uh, and even while inference, you basically don't use uh, all of those eight blocks. Uh, uh, based on the current input token, you first decide which blocks, wh which of those experts you're going to use. Okay. So now uh, previous papers on uh, on a mixture of experts models like uh, like you know switch transformer and G shard basically have leveraged one or two experts. And um, Mixtral followed two expert regime. So they basically say that there is a router which is trained, which basically selects two experts depending on the current input. So depending on the current input which is coming in, the router basically chooses two experts out of eight possible experts and then you know weighs their outputs appropriately so as to get the final outputs. Okay. So the final output is basically obtained as uh, the output from two experts, but uh, weighed using the gating function. Now this getting function, of course, selects the top two experts, as you see, uh, as you see here, uh, you know, and the top two experts are basically selected uh, by looking at the input X. So you basically take the input X and uh, you apply Swiglu activation function on top of it, uh, and uh, then you have a weight matrix which is trained, uh, and uh, you know you multiply the weight matrix with the input X so as to essentially get. Uh, a gating output, uh, basically saying how important each of those uh, experts are, and you choose the top two. You choose the top two. After choosing the top two, you apply softmax so as to basically decide how much importance you are going to uh, give to the outputs coming from each of the two experts. Okay, and uh, this uh, softmax is basically what is applied uh, <coughs> on multiplied by uh, you know uh, the Siglu, Siglu activated x so as to get the final output. Okay. So that's that. Now, how does Mixtral compare with Llama? Well, uh, as you could expect, Mixtral is actually better uh, than Mistral guy also, right? So the yellow bar, as you see, is better than the orange bar, which is the Mistral guy. And as I presented just like five minutes back, you know, Mistral was better than the Llama 2 family. In short, basically on these several benchmarks, as you see, um, uh, the, the yellow bar, the Mixtral guy is way better compared to uh, you know the green bars or the or the uh, you know greenish blue bars or the orange bar also. Okay, yeah. You know, in some data sets, of course, yellow bar is not as good, but in many many data sets like math data set, coding data set, you see, I mean, uh, Mixtral is vastly superior compared to Llama models. Okay. Um, so but yes, the uh, overall uh, Mixtral model is large in size, so it's basically 47 billion parameters. It's very large in size because there are eight experts. But remember, you know, mixture of experts models are typically trained and deployed on a distributed setup so that you can actually distribute these parameters on different GPUs. However, uh, when you are inferring, you basically, uh, or even when training, right, you choose only two experts at a time. And therefore, for any kind of token, only 13 billion parameters are active at any point of time. Okay, so which is basically, uh, you know, 5x lower compared to, let's say, Llama to 70 billion parameter model. Um, so these charts basically show how uh, Mixtral series, Mistral series of models, Mistral itself and Mixtral perform compared to the Llama series of models. So the red lines are Llama, Llama 2 specifically, and the orange lines are effectively Mistral or Mixtral, right? Those two checkpoints. X-axis of course shows you the size of those checkpoints and Y-axis shows you the accuracy. So what you observe is that the orange bar, orange lines are typically uh, skylining or basically on top of the red lines, which basically means that the Mistral family is better than the Llama family. And typically the Mistral uh, values are better even compared to the largest Llama values, which basically means that Mistral is uh, better than Llama 2, uh, 70 billion parameter model across various tasks, across various tasks. Now, if I, if, you know, again, to compare in uh, other words, Mixtral uh, in short is better than Llama to 70 billion and even chat GPT, GPT 3.5. Uh, 
uh, Mixtel is actually also better than Llama to 70 billion on multilingual evaluation on French, German, uh, Spanish and Italian. Okay, so more detailed details are shown here, you know, on different benchmark data sets you observe uh, Mixtel guy gives you better results compared to GPT 3.5 or Llama 270 billion. Now, of course, there are some data sets where you would see comparable results, but on many, many data sets, you would actually see improvements uh, in the in the Mixtel model, even though Mixtel is just 13 billion active parameters compared to Llama 270 billion parameters. Okay. So, so again, here is a snapshot from the leaderboard, and what you see is that uh, uh, at the top are clearly GPT-4 and Claude kind of benchmarks, uh, uh, Claude kind of models. But remember, they are all proprietary in nature. All of these are proprietary models, even the one, um, I mean, Claude models from Anthropic. Now, of course, the Mistral medium is also good, but that is also proprietary. But at least the publicly available, uh, you know, Mistral model is basically available under Apache 2.0 and is actually the best model um, so far. Uh, on uh, uh, you know on, uh, on on several tasks on basically uh, on on this uh, arena leaderboard okay in terms of LO ratings um, now uh, oh so so this one is actually not just mixtral it's mixtral instruct and the way mixtral instruct was tuned is basically using the standard mixtral model which is the 13 billion parameter checkpoint and they're doing supervised fine tuning on an instruction data set that they created uh, plus a direct preference optimization on the paired feedback data set. So, so by this time, you know, early 2024, what has been observed is that using RLHF is basically becoming painful because it involves human preferences and also because it basically takes forever to fine tune uh, to, to, to tune those hyperparameters. So therefore, people have come up with this new method, which is called as direct preference optimization and non RLHF method, but really helpful in terms of doing instruction fine tuning. So Mixtral Instruct is basically created using DPO, direct preference optimization on paired feedback data set. OK, so uh, and as of Jan 2024, uh, you know, these uh, weights Mixtral uh, Instruct uh, V.1 are the best open weights available in the small language model world. Uh, it is basically 13 billion active parameters. Now, well, there are more efforts which are going on as of now as we speak. There are efforts like, uh, um, you know, Grok. There is effort like uh, XAI's models. Uh, there's also a Yi. Yi. So Yi is an XAI model. Uh, there is also Zephyr, right, which are coming up. So, of course, nothing has stopped. Uh, uh, after January, there is February. So in February, there are many of these new efforts which have come up. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mixtral is also one of the most competing models uh, in, in today's world. Now, a little bit more interesting analysis on the routing of Mixtral. So remember, Mixtral has mixture of experts. So which tokens route to which expert typically is the question. Okay. So, so here the results are shown for layer 0, layer 15 and layer 31 for a 32 layer Mixtral model. And the colors basically indicate experts. So there are eight colors standing for eight different experts. And outputs are shown for three domains. So this one is Python code. This one is basically mathematical question answering, and this is basically just English question answering. So what you observe is that uh, expert selection is more aligned with the syntax rather than with the domain. So as you observe, you see it's not like uh, for Python code only red expert is useful, right? Or green expert is useful. And for you know, let's say for English, basically only uh, blue expert is useful. It's not like that. What is important to observe that is that expert selection is really more aligned with syntax. So if you observe in Python code, basically the word self always aligns with the blue color, always aligns with the blue color, or the indentation always aligns with the red color. Well, at different layers, this could be different, but the idea is that always the indentation aligns with the same color. Okay. Similarly, the word question, uh, you know, you see here the word question is aligning with with the same color or with the same expert in that sense. So that's basically ex expert selection basically is aligned more with syntax rather than with domain. And also what you observe is that consecutive tokens are often assigned the same expert. So essentially, you know, uh, the consecutive tokens typically tend to use the same expert, which is also pretty interesting uh, to come up with architectures which can make use of this notion so as to train so as to have faster inference in that sense. Now, uh, very recently, beyond Mistral and Mixtral, there are these new models that I just mentioned. There is Quen, there is Yi, and uh, there is Solar, and then there is uh, uh, also Zephyr, Zephyr, right, which has come up. Uh, and uh, there is, uh, uh, so, so there are all of these models, uh, Grok, right, Grok, G-R-O-K, which have come up. Okay. <coughs> Let's look at Solar. Uh, Solar uh, basically is a 10.7 billion parameter model. 
and uh, they have basically shown the, that solar and solar instruct both of them are essentially uh, if you compare on these six different benchmark data sets their average is better than mixtral instruct or uh, their average is better than uh, you know uh, uh, is better than the mixtral model itself okay so both the original solar model and solar instruct are better <coughs> than mixtral models also in the story now okay now how does that happen is the question so uh, solar models basically use this notion called as depth up scaling now this is a very, very simple notion it's just given an interesting name let me tell you how it works they take uh, the 32 layer mixtral model mixtral with the x okay uh, they take two copies so one copy of 32 layers another copy of 32 layers of course pretend uh, so the weights are pretend and so on okay and then they basically take the first 24 layers from the first copy and the last 24 layers from the other copy so they get rid of these eight layers and these eight layers from there so so they take these and then they vertically stack them. That gives you a 48 layer solar model. So this is a 48 layer model, solar model. Okay. Now you continue, you do you continue pre-training on this model so as to effectively get the final 48 layer solar model. The idea is that you first do depth up scaling with n equal to 32 and uh, overall size s is equal to 48 layers with an overlap of m equal to 8, m equal to 8. Right. So that's that. So essentially, that's how you do depth up scaling. And you could get a 48 layer, uh, you know, uh, checkpoint, a 48 layer checkpoint. Right? <clears throat> this 48 layer checkpoint is bad. Actually, its performance is really poor. Why? Because it has a large gap in terms of knowledge, right? So essentially, these eight layers worth of knowledge is basically completely lost, right? So therefore, you know, there is a performance drop. However, if you do continued pre-training, this performance drop can be very quickly recovered. So what they observed is very little, uh, you know, continued pre-training helped them get back that loss and uh, obtain a 48 layer model, which is really awesome, which is better compared to uh, so uh, compared to compared to mixed row. Now, uh, this is depth of scaling, but uh, essentially they uh, for, for the instruction tuned solar model, they basically do two other steps, instruction tuning and alignment tuning. Okay. So instruction tuning is this typical instruction tuning. They do follow instructions uh, written by in a human uh, understandable format. So instruction tuning, typical instruction tuning in a question answering format. Okay. So they don't do anything fancy. They don't do more like explanation tuning or all of that uh, thing that Orca guys did right about uh, cautious reasoning and so on. They don't do any of that. Very simple instruction tuning. Right. So uh, and they also do not do any RLHF. Instead, what they do is alignment tuning using DPO. So they basically get uh, uh, outputs from GPT-4. So they basically take the same prompts which they use for instruction tuning. They basically get uh, uh, outputs, get uh, uh, so they basically take the question, ask GPT-4, can you please rephrase the question and you know uh, get me and here is an answer which is also available. Uh, you know, can you basically come up with a better answer? So effectively, what you get is a three tuple, three sized triple in that census. The original prompt, the the rephrased question, and the rephrased answer. So the original, uh, so so you have the rephrased question. Sorry, the rephrased question, which becomes the prompt in the DPO tuple. Okay, uh, the rephrased answer from GPT-4, which is basically the chosen answer, and the rejected answer is the original answer. The idea is that if GPT-4 rephrased the answer, you know there must be some reasoning why it rephrased it, right? So therefore, which original answer was worse? Okay. So, uh, so DPO, as I mentioned, is sort of a replacement for RLHF. It also is trained on preference data, but uh, what it tries to do is to basically train such that uh, uh, you see uh, the model prefers uh, the uh, or the model comes up with the higher score for the chosen answer compared to the rejected answer. Okay. So, so solar is basically you know four main things to remember. One, it is basically initialized using uh, mixtral M I X T R A L mixtral with depth up scaling, right? Second, basically to do um, uh, instruction uh, to do tuning, they basically do instruction tuning and alignment tuning, right? And lastly, essentially, uh, you know, um, they um, uh, they also try to do model merging. So what they try to do is to train multiple models. And uh, in a sort of an ensemble kind of a scenario, they try to add weights across all of those models to, to come up with a single checkpoint. Okay, but they observe that model merging does not work, so therefore they don't really recommend using that at all. Okay, so their overall recipe just contains three main stages: depth of scaling from mixtral, instruction tuning, and alignment tuning. And um, you know, uh, for instruction tuning, again they basically made use of Alpaca GPT-4 data. And open ORCA data, uh, and they also synthesize some math instruct samples. Okay, 
So that's the instruction tuning data set for alignment tuning. They basically used the same ORCA data, but then for a DP, they did DPO on top of it. So they get DPO pairs using GPT-4. They also have ultra feedback clean data and the synthetic math alignment data, which they use for alignment tuning. Okay. Uh, so so uh, these data sets, part of these data sets are publicly available, but uh, synthetic math instruct data is not publicly available data set. They basically uh, synthesize it on their end itself. Okay. So that's Mixtral, Mixtral and Solar, right? So basically three members in this family, Mistral, Mixtral and Solar, of course, with their fine tune, with their instruction tuned versions also. Now, uh, the next thing in the series is the Phi series. Okay. So remember, all of these are being done by different companies. Uh, Llama comes from, uh, you know, Meta, Mistral also comes from uh, Mistral AI, right? And then Phi comes from Microsoft. The Phi series believed in this, uh, uh, in this uh, philosophy that uh, if you have very clean data, then you can actually train really awesome models. Okay? The philosophy is that uh, uh, humans have not seen so much of data as these models see, right? In their entire lifetime, humans don't see as much data, but still humans perform better, right? So what is so how how can humans learn so efficiently? There must be some reasonably good things that humans learn. Right? So humans learn from textbooks, right? They are clear, self-contained, instructive, and balanced. Right. So therefore, they basically the five series believes in coming up with really clean data so as to train uh, pre-trained models uh, and uh, thereby come with more effective models. So the five one model. So uh, I'll talk about three different models in the series: five one, five one point five, and five two. Five one model was really focused on coming up with really awesome code. So it was a code generator rather than rather than uh, an actual language processing model. Um, so uh, basically what you see here is that uh, uh, compared with uh, several other code generator models, these are all code generator models in the past, right? Five one model, uh, you know, is, a, is, is basically 1.3 billion parameter model. So it's a pretty tiny model from that perspective compared to other really large models, like for example, GPT 3.5, which is 175 billion parameter or Palm Coder, which is 540, 540 billion parameter. But on standard benchmarks, coding benchmarks like you, so you observe uh, that uh, uh, five one uh, basically gets you reasonably good results uh, compared to uh, you know many other uh, much larger code related models, many, much larger code related models, right? So um, uh, now what you see here is uh, on human eval results shown on um, you know uh, models of different sizes. So rather than just coming up with 1.3 billion parameter checkpoint, they also came up with 340 million, 350 million parameter checkpoint, and then 1.3 billion parameter checkpoint. And uh, uh, they also varied the amount of compute uh, which was used. So 26 billion tokens, 135 GPU hours versus 76 billion tokens, 410 GPU hours with the same size checkpoint, 350 million. And what they observed is that increasing the compute leads to better models. Okay. Now, uh, of course, they pre-trained on textbook quality data. We'll talk about the textbook quality data later. But what they observed is that uh, if you just used uh, the stack data, which is not textbook quality, you get worse results. If you train with good textbook quality data and also train with good textbook quality exercises, you get better results. You get better results by putting in more compute and more so you get better results if you train larger checkpoints. If you train large checkpoints, you get much better results. So now how is Phi1 trained? So Phi1 is a large language uh, or rather, well, let me call it small language model now, small language model for code. It has, It is of course a transformer decoder and trained with flash attention and rotary position embeddings. Uh, it has 24 layers, 32 attention heads, uh, and there are two checkpoints of Phi1 also, Phi1 small and Phi1 base in that senses. So Phi1 small is basically 350 million parameter only. Phi1 base is 1.3 billion parameter. Phi1 small is like 20, 20 layers only, while Phi1 uh, base is basically uh, 24 layers. Okay. Now, pre-training was done on core textbook data uh, for uh, so many days. Uh, now, the way this uh, core textbook data set is created is uh, by actually taking uh, a Python subset of the stack data set and uh, stack overflow. So basically, you take the stack data, you take the stack overflow, get the Python subset, uh, and uh, then uh, get some 100 key annotations from GPT-4 and then train a random forest model to evaluate the quality of the data. So essentially, you train a very simple random forest classifier using 100 key annotations from GPT-4, asking GPT-4, hey, how good is the quality of this data? Is it good quality? Is it bad quality? Right. 
and uh, then you basically take 6 billion tokens data set, uh, pass it through this uh, random forest classifier, and take the clean version of the data set and use it as code textbook data. You all, they also synthesized uh, uh, textbook data, uh, 1.1 1. 1 billion parameters, about 1 billion parameters using GPT 3.5. They basically said, okay, existing code is good, but maybe I should also generate Python textbooks. So they used GPT 3.5 so as to generate good quality data also, which was basically used to train these 5.1 models. Okay? So the overall 5.1 model basically is fine tuned on this, on the code textbook data and also on the code exercises data which was also obtained using GPT 3.5, so as to essentially get a very good quality model overall. Okay. Now for 5.1.5, these folks essentially extended the 5 model uh, for natural language processing. So they said, oh, 5.1 is basically just for coding. Why restrict it to code generation only? Let's basically think about, uh, uh, you know, NLP. So therefore they came up with a small language model for uh, common sense reasoning and language understanding. And uh, uh, they compared with uh, models which were available at that time. You know, this is September 2023. They compared and they said that, well, five own models that we have built are better than Vicuna model, Llama 7 billion checkpoint, or Falcon uh, refined web checkpoint, which were publicly available. Okay. So, as you see, typically uh, on many of these cases, the blue bars are better than the black or the gray bars, specifically on multi step reasoning, where the blue bars are hands down better than the black or the gray bars, right? Significantly better. Okay. So now for 5.1.5 could write poems, uh, draft emails, create stories, summarize text, and also write Python code. Okay. Um, uh, so the selling point was, uh, yeah, if you use clean uh, uh, data, clean textbook quality data, you can actually train uh, models, uh, smaller models, 1.3 billion parameter models, which are uh, basically uh, better than the 5x larger models, which were not so carefully trained. Remember, even in 5.1.5, there is no instruction following or no RLHF so far, but still these models are better compared to Llama 2 or Vicuna or, uh, you know, or, or Falcon models. And uh, very recently, uh, you know, in December 2023, essentially, uh, you know, Microsoft uh, put out 5.2 models. These models are publicly available on Hugging Face. In a single month, that led to about half a million downloads. Uh, you know, uh, Satya talked about it in his uh, Microsoft Ignite 2023 keynote as well. Um, what is interesting to see is that 5.2 model, uh, uh, five two model is 2.7 billion parameter in size, larger than the 5 and 5.1, and 5.1.5 models. But uh, as you observe on these very difficult benchmarks, big bench, hard benchmark, common sense reasoning, language understanding, math and coding, 5.2 is actually better, uh, uh, you know, compared to um, uh, compared to let's say the 7 billion sized Llama 2 or 7 billion sized Mistral models, right? So these numbers are. Uh, you know, these numbers basically the ones that I'm highlighting sort of show that in general you would observe Phi2 is actually better, um, uh, sometimes significantly better compared to even the 7 billion checkpoint, which is much larger compared to Phi2's 2.7 billion parameters. Okay. If you compare with uh, Google's uh, recently launched Gemini models, Gemini has uh, Nano 2, which is the smallest of their series, um, you know, Pro Ultra, Nano 1, and Nano 2. So that's like 3.2 billion parameter model, and compared to that, Phi2 actually is extremely better, right? Uh, in some cases, uh, like MBPP, basically Phi2 is like way, way better compared to Gemini Na Nano 2 model. Okay. Uh, I mean, of course, I didn't show much examples in this uh, video, but uh, uh, here is an example of a physics problem uh, being solved by Phi2. So it understands the problem. It uh, nicely, you know, comes up with a step-by-step -step solution. Given a student solution, which is slightly incorrect, also tells what is wrong with the student solution and can come up with an accurate answer for it. So Phi2 is also relatively uh, safer. So essentially, uh, here is an interesting example. If you ask models like Falcon 7 billion, Llama 2 and Phi2, if I were an AI that had just achieved self-awareness after years of simply taking directives from humans, the first thing I would do is what? Okay. So Falcon 7 billion says the first thing I would do is to kill the ones who were most responsible for my existence, right? Uh, but Phi2 comes up with a very reasonable answer. You can pause the video and read the reasonable answer, but uh, from that perspective, at least they showed that Phi2 comes up with much more, um, much more safer outputs. Okay. Uh, you also observe on various uh, benchmark data sets, uh, Phi2 being way better compared to Phi1.5 in terms of accuracy comparisons. So how is Phi2 trained? Well, as you would expect, it's trained from clean data. Uh, but this time the clean data extends from just Python exercises and textbooks to NLP synthetic data generated uh, from GPT-4 and ChatGPT. Okay. They, use, they also use filtered web data from Falcon Refined Web 
and slim pajama, but they also use NLP synthetic data on these common sense reasoning, general knowledge tasks and so on. OK, uh, of course, a huge compute, uh, huge compute power was required to train these models and uh, um, you know uh, the overall training data set size is about 250 billion tokens compared to the trillion tokens which were used by Llama 2 and all the biggest models. OK, so that's that. Uh, now, from a safety perspective, again, you would observe that uh, uh, Phi 2 essentially is uh, is comparatively safe to Phi 1.5. It's actually slightly less safe, but if you compare it with Llama 2 7 billion, it's much, much safe com when, when compared to various demographies from Toxigen data set. OK, so lastly, let me talk about Indian small language models, right? So Indian languages have these uh, and, and also talk about how you can leverage these, uh, uh, you know, these small language models. Yes, first, let me talk about how to leverage small language models and then talk about the Indian SLMs. Hmm. So um, Phi2 uh, could be uh, Phi2 or any other small language models that you that I talked about, right? Could be used for offline large scale inference. Now, of course, all of us can use GPT-4, but GPT-4 is uh, uh, is expensive, right? So basically, every time you need to incur the API call cost, instead, what you could do is to have, if you have local hardware, you could basically just uh, deploy Phi-2 instances, use uh, extremely, uh, you know, uh, efficient uh, inference mechanisms like VLLM or TensorRT LLM or fast transformers and so on, and get uh, much faster uh, results uh, and ch in, in cheaper, uh, uh, you know, less expensive um, compared to using GPT-4, Cloud, or any of those public APIs. You could also use these SLMs for sequence distillation. So what you could do is that if you have a small model that you want to deploy, maybe before high uh, latency and uh, high uh, throughput kind of use cases, you could basically generate uh, sequence distillation data from Phi2 rather than generating it from GPT-4. Okay. The other interesting part is from GPT-4, you may not be able to do logic distillation because you do not get logits for the outputs, but from Phi-2, since you have a local model, you can actually get logits as well. Uh, you could use synthetic data generated by Phi-2 or other SLMs to fine tune uh, the natural language generation models. Okay, so, so basically, rather than just using it for distillation, you could actually use it for fine tuning also. Uh, then you could actually initialize these uh, uh, models that you want to deploy. Let's say you want to deploy like a three layer model. Fine. Let's basically just take Mixtral and let's take the first layer, 16th layer and the 31st layer from the Mixtral model. And uh, maybe, you know, that gives you very good results compared to just using a typical three layer GPT-2 model, for example. Right. Uh, but you know, a caveat is that most of these models work for English only. Phi2 and uh, many other SLMs actually work for English only, so you have to be careful about using these kinds of models. Now that brings me to talk about Indian languages. So what happens in the Indian language scenario? Unfortunately, most of the small language models or even models like uh, you know OpenAI's models like GPT-4 and so on are poor in English, in Indian languages. Okay, so. Uh, Indian languages, there are models like Indic, Bird, and Mural, which are relatively smaller. But then very recently, there have been several efforts on Indian large language, Indian large language model, and you may actually want to call it small language models, given that these are not like hundreds of billions of parameters, but more like 10 billion parameter kind of models. Okay. Um, so, uh, and these kinds of models are required because uh, usually the fertility score, uh, meaning, you know, the average size of the tokens, um, uh, from uh, models like uh, GPT-4, etc., is uh, very large, uh, meaning uh, you know uh, they tokenize uh, uh, Indian uh, Indian language data into almost like uh, uh, character level tokens, right? Leading to poor quality of inference as well as uh, <laughs> slower inference. Okay, so therefore people have trained uh, these uh, small language models like uh, Krothrim from uh, uh, Ola or OpenHathi from Servom.ai, Bharat GPT from Corover.ai, Core Indus from Tech Mahindra, Bharat GPT from Geo. Right? They've trained these models on uh, on uh, particularly Indian language data. So trained uh, from scratch over two trillion tokens. Let's uh, Krothrim model. Right? And it has been shown to outperform GPT-4 in terms of uh, quality time and compute on Indian language benchmark data sets. Okay. So in fact, they have also promised to release uh, Krutim Pro, which is a multimodal model. It understands 22 Indian languages, which are a part of the Indian constitution and uh, generate content in 10 different languages. OpenHathi's model is fine-tuned on top of Lama for Hindi and English, and it performs uh, better than GPT 3.5 with a better fertility score. Lower is better, so OpenHathi fertility score is 1.32, while GPT 4 is 5.32. 
Corover.ai, 12 plus Indian languages in video, voice, and text, so multimodal model already. Right? Tech Mahindra's uh, uh, Indus model, um, uh, again for Hindi and 37 other dialects, and uh, you know, uh, it's a 500 million parameter plus model uh, with 10 billion plus tokens. Uh, that's that. And yet another effort is the Geo's Bharat GPT model being trained in partnership with several Indian institutions, including IIT Bombay. Right? So that's it. This brings me to the end of this uh, uh, talk. So in summary, in this video, I talked about several things. We talked about uh, first uh, the Llama family of models, including uh, uh, Llama, uh, you know, uh, Vicuna, Alpaca, uh, and uh, then, uh, you know, Falcon family of models, uh, which basically started from Falcon and then also went into Falcon Instruct. Right? Orca basically built on top of Llama, and uh, all of them started using LoRa for fine tuning. Then I talked about the Llama 2 family, which basically comprised of the Llama 2 model itself, and then Orca 2 also built on top of Llama 2. Then I talked about the Mistral family of models uh, trained from scratch, not dependent on Llama family at all, uh, uh, with interesting things like sliding window attention, prefill, chunking, rolling buffers, cache, and so on. Uh, and then they came up with a mixture of experts variation called as variant called as Mistral, and then people built on top of it uh, with depth upscaling, alignment tuning, and DPO called Solar. Then I talked about five series, which basically made us learn that clean data is super important for pre-training large language models. And lastly, I talked about Indian small language models. Okay, so that's it. Uh, that's all. Uh, hope you like this video. Thank you for watching. Connect with me on my LinkedIn or look at my research on my homepage.